after years of working hard, you know, that origin story of <laughs> being kind of a young kid moving out in early age, finding a lot of wins and success in the entrepreneurial journey to giving up the agency because I actually closed the agency to fully focus in. Even after we had three offices, we were growing, we had great clients. I refocused everything into the startup that we were now shelving. So that moment was really tough. Wow. That was a, a time of, I failed and I, maybe I was never good enough to do any of this. And so as I, you know, it, it's hard even today. Cause I, I, I look back at that, but I, I I'm thankful for everything I learned from that experience. Cause I wouldn't be able to do what I do now without it. It doesn't yeah. change that it was hard. I decided to move on. And so again, I'm asking that question now after I'd felt I'd had so much set for so long, what's next again. And so part of this entrepreneurial journey for me was again, coming back to that inner voice of not blaming myself for say the past failures, but really learning from what each of them taught me. And so in that moment, I'm like, well, what have I learned? What have I loved doing? Where have I made the most impact? What can I show up for every day and get really excited about? And I love that old Mike Tyson quote where he's like, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. Man, if you don't get punched in the face a million times over when you're running your own business or you're an entrepreneur, and if you're not, if you don't love that, I mean, nobody loves getting punched in the face, but if it doesn't excite you to solve those problems and to figure it out, and you can't see the end vision of where this is going to go, if you do this right, then maybe you're not cut out to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is, and that's fine. Hi folks. Welcome back to the Boom Vision Podcast. I am excited to share this week's guest, Zach Swire, who is a business coach and visionary entrepreneur. I truly appreciate Zach's authentic sharing of the highs and lows of his entrepreneurial journey. It's remarkable to hear what entrepreneurship has taught him about persevering, being purpose-driven, and heart-centered. You'll definitely want to tune in to hearing Zach's story and takeaways he shares in this week's episode. Let's cue the intro. Welcome to the Boom Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Ye. This show is about how you can thrive. It's when you build success in alignment with your mind, body, and soul. I created this podcast to give you perspectives and frameworks on how to strengthen your mindset and gain clarity in your purpose. It's time for you to live an extraordinary life with vision that you design. Let's get to work. Success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. This quote was by Winston Churchill. Welcome to episode 32 of the Boom Vision Podcast. Folks, I am thrilled to share today's interview with Zach Swire. I met Zach over the summer through a mutual friend, Dan Bennett, who you might remember as a guest on the Boom Vision Podcast in episode 18. In connecting with Zach, we had so much in common. As a fellow business coach and having similar map and internal compass, I just knew Zach would be a fantastic guest in sharing his unfiltered journey as an entrepreneur. As a brief background, Zach Swire is a business coach and a lifelong visionary entrepreneur. Zach has founded and built five companies from the ground up an award-winning strategic ad agency, a social good tech company, a co-working space, a e-com serial brand, and now a business coach company and community. Zach loves supporting various communities, nonprofit, and social impact organizations. Married to his wife Gwen of 20 years, they put their faith and family first. From tennis matches to show choir competitions and musicals, they love being involved in the lives of their 15-year-old triplets. Zach launched Top Teams and his Top Coach community in 2020 with the purpose of helping companies and coaches change for good, creating stronger companies, happier employees, and healthier communities. By expanding their circle of impact, they leave a positive stamp on the world around us. So without further ado, here's Zach. Zach Swire, welcome to the Boom Vision Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ben. 
It's so great to be able to speak to you today, Zach. I love to start with your origin story. Where did it all start for you that led to where you are today? Oh man, I love that question. <laughs> I'm going to go right back. It always makes me think of the Goonies. If you're like a 80s, grew up in the 80s. Oh fan, yeah. <laughs> you remember when the hand's in the blender and he's like going way far back. Okay. So my origin story. Wow. I guess it's just one of those things where I have been an entrepreneur all my life, whether I knew it or not, as a young kid walking around picking up sticks and mowing lawns, um, somehow had to figure out there to start my own thing and and been doing it for a long time ever since. So let's take a step back. Um, if I go way, way back, even like great grandfather, they were, I guess my great grandfather was an entrepreneur and had been in England and partnered with a guy in France who uh, had created a makeup line, Baluti by Dick Soar or something. It's in the makeup books, you know, it's like some history of foundation and, you know, they had launched and sold the Max Factor in the fifties. Um, after that, my dad, I wouldn't say was much of an entrepreneur. Um, he had a different path, um, but he does have his own small business in Southern England today. And, uh, and my mom took care of us at home. And, you know, so we, I didn't have that as much, but when I was about 15, my older brother, he's about 10 years older, invited me to come out to California. And so, you know, of course, 15 year old, I wasn't, had never been to California. I'd been to visit one time when I was a little younger, but I was like, yeah, it sounds fun. So I came out and he had run his own business and he had a pager company, cell phone paging. And he had a, they started selling Motorola phones, the old brick phones that went in cars. Uh, and he yeah. said, come work with me. And I'm like, great, that's fun. Work with my older brother, you know? And so I got out there and I realized this is really cool. And he was always so diligent about teaching great customer service and, and really instilling some things about business to me that were really key. And also the hard work. I remember sitting on his floor at his house and helping him with billing and printing everything out. And like, what are we doing? It's late at night. Why am I still doing this? I'm like 15, man. But I had fun because I was with him. And he made it fun. And then I remember the next day, he was also like putting tile on people's floors because he had to hustle to make it work because the pager company wasn't paying all the bills, right? But he had bought a nice house and he had a nice car and he was working hard and he had a young kid. And I thought, man, this is pretty cool. He gets to set his own schedule and do his own thing. And so I really thank my older brother for instilling this kind of love of this entrepreneurial journey to me early on, because I knew I was already kind of entrepreneurial minded. You know, when I was young, I always looked to kind of start or do my own thing. Um, so fast forward, he invited me to stay in California and actually moved in with him when I was 16. So as I've mentioned, some things at home were a little tough and, you know, we had moved around a lot, but that provided some new stability in terms of California. And I came in and finished high school here in California, where I'm at now still today, and and just had a great time. Life became really kind of fun spending time with him. And it also opened my mind to what I could do and where I could go. And so as I went off to, to college, actually had a brief stint, I was in the, the military before that, and then... As I got back into school after I served, I I just didn't know what path I was going to take, but I knew I loved this idea of entrepreneurship. And I had a professor in college who was just so infectious. And as I think about this guy, I still think about him today because he he was teaching an intro to marketing course. And at the time, I'm like, I probably couldn't even define marketing. You know, as a young student, I'm like, I don't know, what is marketing? You know, is this something to do with a grocery store? <laughs> that was really stupid at the time. I'm like, okay, I don't know a ton about business, but I knew my brother's business. I knew my experiences. I worked hard because I, I took on personally a few jobs to be able to work and go to school and pay for school. Um, but all of a sudden, I found this passion from one teacher who was so enthralled with marketing and gave me an opportunity to really excel in his class. I mean, it really came alongside me as he saw a spark there. And so his name was Tom Boyd. And uh, I don't know where he's at today. I think he's in Florida. Um, last I had, had seen him years ago, moved off to be like a dean of a school there when the online schools were starting to boom. But that passion got me so excited. I remember writing my first marketing plan and it was about a VW microbus. I don't even think they ever made it. I think they're actually about to launch it now, finally, all these years later. But I wrote this really cool plan with the team project. And I was just so excited that we could take on this challenge and come up with new solutions and think about why we needed to launch this product. And it was so fun to me. And so um, going fast forward from those days in college to getting inspired to marketing, I did complete my marketing degree. And then I got offered a job from a family friend who was also an entrepreneur. And I wasn't even done with school. I, he's like, he called me up one day. I think it was like October sometime. And I'm like, I'm still in school. And he's like, well, you come down to this trade show. It was in Orange County. And I said, okay, you know, um, Wolf, I'll, I'll come down. So I came down and met with him. And he introduced me to a Chinese guy that he had partnered with who was an inventor. And he had invested in one of his products. And he said, hey, 
I really like what this guy's doing and I know you're in marketing. Uh, maybe you can help him out. And I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, at the time I had been working, I worked at Rainbird overnight, the sprinkler company doing paperwork. And I had, I had waited tables and done all the jobs to learn about great service. And I worked hard. I worked, I didn't want to have a big you know, debt when I got out of school. So I always worked to be able to pay my way and figure things out until that time. He said, you know, I've got something else for you. Maybe you can come join us. You know, and it wasn't, I'd say huge pay or anything, but it was a great opportunity. It was one of those, Hey, we're getting this launched. I'm investing in it. We've got a building space next to one of his other companies. I said, yeah, I'll come join. And so right out of school, I had this amazing opportunity to come and help him expand this new concept. And so it was something in the medical field as a medical device. And I didn't know anything about medical devices, but what I did know is I was a problem solver and I love solving problems. And so I was able to then join that company. We were called Blade X. And he, I think he sold like 40 devices in the last three years. And over the next year and a half, we sold over 400 more. And it was figuring out distributorships, flying around to events, you know, me getting my feet wet, learning what I didn't know, because I made tons of mistakes, I'm sure, you know, early 20s at the time, not knowing what I didn't know. But I just went out there and, and tried to figure it out. During school, I was also part of the American Marketing Association and had some mentors. And so at, fast forward to where that company is now starting to grow and we're figuring things out. Um, I got an offer from one of the mentors to say, I'm building an ad agency. Would you come join me? And so I went to join his small firm in Costa Mesa and spent the next year and a half commuting four hours a day. So if you know LA, it wasn't really that far, but it's, you know, that's a long across. commute. <laughs> and that's where the first time I think I realized there's more to work life than just work. I have to be more personally balanced too, because I remember my new wife at the time saying, I can't sit on the phone and talk to you, you know, for two hours each way, because I get frustrated. And I'm like, I didn't grow up here in LA. I'm not used to this. I can't imagine I was doing the math, you know, you're like, how many hours a day am I wasting? This is insane. I could be doing so much more. And yeah, we didn't have kids or anything at the time, but I was just really struggling with it. Um, and so I remember talking to the owner and I just said, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out either. I've got a partner and we got to look at moving out here. Or I'm going to have to think of something else. And I went the, he wasn't willing to partner. He had had a bad business relationship prior and I wished him well. And I left and I started my own agency out of a bedroom. We had bought our first house. We we're early twenties. My wife's a speech pathologist and she, we moved right down the street from her parents in our little town, Glendora here. And it was, it was opportunity to just start doing marketing and advertising for some clients. And I hired a few contractors and just started getting projects and, you know, kind of learning that hustle that I had from my brother just to go out and make it happen. I didn't know what I didn't know, but I thought I can do this. And I went out and found some clients. And I remember leaning into that first year, I, I needed to make it go. And I was starting to get a little worried. You know, it's it's not easy to get a business off the ground. But then I, I just put it out there and I went for some clients and picked up this great project where somehow I got to write like a holiday TV spot. And I'm not, I'm not a copywriter by trade, but, you know, they liked what I was writing. So I, I worked with some freelancers and created a radio spot, TV spots, direct mail campaigns. Um, and, and what I did do well is I really loved both the art and the science. I wouldn't say I'm the best artist in the world or the best at creative. Um, there's certainly creative agencies, brand agencies that are stellar in that. But what we always tried to blend was like this art and science approach. So what I did learn was we got to make these effective. Like don't just do advertising, but do effective advertising. Target the right people, really help people with your products. And so I found that when we did that first campaign, it was a quarter million dollar campaign. And I'm like, I'm working out of a bedroom office in my 20s at the time. I'm like, yeah, score a million dollars. And then quickly realizing, well, that's not how much money you make because you got all the expenses and everything else. But it still set me up pretty good to work on getting the next bigger project. Um, also, it provided some great stories. And those stories were the great stories to tell. So then I could start expanding this agency. The agency was my last name, Swire Marketing. Later shortened it to Swire when we brought in a new uh, head of creative. And I would say part of that or origin story was me really stopping for a minute. And I would think uh, a legal counsel had in Pasadena, Leatrice Latz, who I'd met with early, early on. And she had sat me down and said, Zach, you know, I need you to close your eyes and I need you to really look inside to understand, you know, what that inner voice is telling you that where are you supposed to be? Where is this going? Like, what is your calling? Like, how can you envision this? So like, say the end of this next year, I want you to plant a picture in your head. And at the time, I'm like, I'm reversing back a little bit from where I just went, but it was 2007 and I've got some good projects. And now I'm like, how do I start to scale this? How do I grow this? Is this going to work? And all those questions were hitting me hard. And on top of that, I found out my wife was pregnant. We've been trying for four years to have a baby and unsuccessfully not, which as you know, as you start approaching 30, you know, you've been trying for a while. It's a really tough thing with the relationship, but all of a sudden we found out she's pregnant. And so 
all this started to matter more. And I had this fledging company where I'm working out of a bedroom office, which was my homebrew room where I used to make beer and my wife would do scrapbooking. But that was our office. That was the business. And now it was time to make this a go. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to picture where this could go. And then all of a sudden, we had a doctor's appointment to find out about the babies. So we go in, I'm sitting there with my wife and they you know, got the little scanner and they pull up the screen and she looks and the nurse starts counting. She says, oh, one, two, three. And I look at her, I'm like, three what? Just like that, three what? Like, I don't know, what are you talking about? What do you mean three what? Like kind of incredulous. And I was like, wait, what do you mean <laughs> three what? So you're having three babies. And I'm like, wait, is that how you break it to somebody? We had, we're having triplets. So it was like, holy wow. cow. Like in that moment, all of a sudden I look at my wife and she starts bawling. And I'm like, she just had no expectation of that. You know, it was four years of us just yeah. dying to have our own kids. And we were even to the point where we were thinking maybe we'll adopt. And and all of a sudden now we were blessed with triplets coming, but all the fear of what that means too at that moment. And the fear of, holy cow, I've got a business that's kind of getting off the ground, but should I go get a job and all that? So when Leatrice said, I need you to envision yourself where you're going to be at the end of this year, it was like, mm. oh my gosh, there's a lot of weight behind this. I don't know. <laughs> You know, so, but thank God I started to plant this picture and I could see it clearly. And I saw seven people in an office and I don't know why it's seven, but I saw seven and, and I saw myself in an office. Remember, I'm still out of a home office at the time. And that next month I told my wife, I'm like, I got to get out of the bedroom. I got to get out of the home office. I got to start. I got to start doing this. And if not, I got to go get a job. And so we decided we signed a lease, which if you started something, you know, that's hard when you're in your early twenties and you're signing a lease and, you know, they're asking for these three to five year deals. And I'm like, how am I going to pay this? If this doesn't work out, it'll put us in a worse situation, but we took the risk. Well, and thank God we did. By the end of the year, closer to the end of the year, we already had seven employees hired. And by the end of that year and the next year, I think we were close to 15. We kept growing. Um, and fast forward over the years, that became our agency, Swire. We were an agency that loved solving problems. And so over the next almost 10 years, continued to grow that agency into communications, education space, doing stuff in, in direct mail was our early start, really getting smart with analytics, have, hiring an incredible guy out of Washington who helped set up an analytics office for us there. And we just loved doing the work we did. We won lots of awards and loyalty and retention, fully understanding customers at a much deeper level. So we weren't just a normal kind of ad marketing agency. We were really foundationally this consultancy that had to first understand the customer journey and then really deeply understand what was going to produce the best results for them. They're really honest and true, not just to go sell another widget. So as we kept expanding that, um, my heart started moving towards more purpose-driven work because I saw we were doing good work here. We were helping these companies grow. But then I also saw some of the work we were doing was just you know selling another widget. And it was like, does this really matter? And I had this moment where I was like, you know, I, I don't know. So we started exploring different projects. And and one of those random projects was uh, we had met a friend in town who was running a local run and he was an Olympian. His name's Brian Clay. He won the gold medal and the silver in the decathlon. And somehow we ended up starting this pilot for like a TV show in Hawaii because he was from Hawaii. And he found a former Miss American. We're like, we're going to make this Passport Hawaii TV show. Don't look it up because the pilot's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> But it was how I failed really badly, really pretty quickly. But we we dove in. We tried to invest in this project. And unfortunately, we weren't from Hawaii. And the creative control all went to their team. And we didn't get to design it. And as soon as they launched it, it looked like a bad episode of an old Saved by the Bell you know, intro. And I was like, I'm done. I'm out. You know, and if you if we can't have control, they even wouldn't let our team on set You know, when we got there. So it was a really weird thing. Wow. But through that, I was visiting Hawaii. And I remember waking up one morning. And and really, again, going back to that inner voice to think about like, okay, I've been at this for a while now. What's next? Am I continuing to grow this agency? I'm really feeling this pull to do more work that matters um, now that my kids are growing too. And it's like, I don't just want to sell widgets. I'm getting pretty good at that, but I want to do something more that matters. And I and I had this dream and I woke up and this name Egood was in my head. And I mean, Egood, this is weird, you know, but whatever. I went on a run and I'm not a big runner, but I thought I got to get out of the house. And it was like six in the morning and I ran over Diamond Head and just looked out at the ocean and I was like, wow, this is so inspirational. This is so amazing. I mean, and just kind of connecting, you know, with the earth around me and just seeing how much opportunity is always in front of us. And I, and I was thinking of this, this idea that I had dreamt about, and it was just simply how do we as a society better give back to those who need that support. And so I thought, Hey, I've been good at building community and doing things like that. So can we better connect people in our communities with businesses who want to give back? That was the initial concept of eGood. 
And so we launched uh, a special project on our agency, hired a couple of people in a side room to start testing out this idea of eGood. Well, eGood was a social good tech platform, basically loyalty and payment system that businesses could use that would enable them to give back a portion of every transaction to a nonprofit. They could choose local nonprofits. They could do special events, fundraisers at higher percentages, and it tied the people into the community. They could see their giving impact on their phones. Um, and we had even greater cool technology too, where you know you walk in, your face would show up on the screen, would have all your likes, dislikes, loyalty was tied in. This is years and years ago. We were a little too early for the market. They weren't quite ready for what we had. Plus, we had a huge challenge of replacing hardware in businesses, which is not easy. And it was requiring a lot of investment. We did go to TechCrunch and got to pitch there, which was awesome. And we ended up winning audience choice, which I was not ready for because my partner, Sven, and I, um, we got there and we were just on the floor with like 300 other small businesses, you know, saying our pitch over and over and over and over again. Um, I'd already been a year like traveling around trying to raise funds, you know, going to all these like startup competitions, all this random stuff and starting to feel a little bit deflated because I was like, man, is this going to really take off? We need some big funding to really make this go. I even remember right before that going to San Diego and had like a 30 second pitch. And it was like, you get on stage and 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 I'm like, I'm getting good at this and maybe too cocky because I got down there and all of a sudden I walk up on stage and forgot it completely out of my head. I could not get a piece of it. And I, rum I don't even know what I said, but I remember walking off the stage, my head down, like, oh gosh, I just wasted this whole day. <laughs> like, And at this point now we're needing to now figure out, I'm taking resources away from the agency, putting a lot into this new company and feeling the pressure from, you know, our early investors and just really the growth of this to say, I've, I've got to choose. I can't do both the agency and continue to scale that and take on this big social good startup we were building. And at this point now, we've actually built a team. We've got some investment in. So we have like 12 developers in-house in the back and we're growing this, this company. We're super excited. We're bringing on test businesses. Um, we're seeing the transactions are working. Uh, we're starting to build it out. We're partnering with companies that we eventually you know, partnered with WorldPay and PayPal and built in these great systems. And so it was a lot to take on. And so when we got to TechCrunch, I still felt we were pretty early on. We we're still kind of testing the waters. But all of a sudden, it was validated by the audience. They loved it. They loved the concept. And we got to speak on stage. Um, and it was really neat to be able to share that with that group. And even the next morning, got in, back in to see Mark Zuckerberg speak on the same stage we were at like right before that. So it was, it was such a cool experience. And, it, and that opened up some doors for potential other investors and other talks. We started building an advisory board to look at how we were going to scale. And we had a great advisor who basically said, your next round is like $50 million if you even plan to start growing this company. And at that point, I'm like, we had just been at 5 million. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I can do it. I'm like starting to see that balance gone with myself, my kids, my family. Mm. I was struggling to try to keep it all running. And we were having some problems because we were really kind of far ahead of the technology curve. Like where everything was at in the market, you know, you had Square coming out, you had a few others that were there, but what we had built was already way more advanced in far as far as what it did, but it was going to take a business deciding to replace what they already had. And that was going to take good, effective sales teams and structure and, and growth of this company that at the time I didn't really have experience in that area. Mm. And so after four years, we, we closed the doors. I never say I shut it down. I actually say I shelved it. Even on the final page of ego, we said, we're, we're kind of putting it on the shelf and we might come back to this someday. Yeah. Um, so after years of working hard, you know, that origin story of, <laughs> being kind of a young kid, moving out in an early age, finding a lot of wins and success in the entrepreneurial journey to giving up the agency because I actually closed the agency to fully focus in. Even after we had three offices, we were growing, we had great clients. I refocused everything into the startup that we were now shelving. So that moment was really tough. Wow. That was a, a time of, I failed and I maybe I was never good enough to do any of this. And so as I, you know, it, it's hard even today because I, I I look back at that, but I, I, I'm i thankful for everything I learned from that experience because I wouldn't be able to do what I do now without it. It doesn't yeah. change that it was hard. And I was able to take some time. And I'm also thankful to a couple of groups that kind of came around me at the time because we converted our office into a co-working space because we had this building, 10,000 square feet. And I'm like, what are we going to do with it? We're in LA, but there's no co-working around here. And I love the concept at the time. And so like early days of co-working, we just turned it into a co-working office, invited people in, which proves when you really solve a customer's job to be done. I love Clay Christensen's theory on that. The customers come because they really need it and it's really solving a problem. And so all of a sudden in a few months, we had the place full of people 
And I was like, wow, this is cool. But then I realized I don't want to run a co-working business. I'm not a real estate guy. I don't want to buy property. I don't want to do all this stuff. Um, but luckily our investor had somebody in San Diego who is expanding his co-working outfit and they ended up, it ended up working out perfect where they were able to turn it into their brand and continue to grow and scale it. And so it worked out between us. It worked out great. And at that time, I got to then meet some folks who we invited into our co-working space. And one was supporting artisans in 200 countries around the world. Um, and they had this shop with a mission. And so they were going in and teaching people how to run their business more effectively, um, how to have more hope that they could get out of these third world conditions and provide for their families. And so I was just really impressed with the work they were doing. And I got invited to go with them on a trip with a friend of mine who had helped launch co-working space, Ryan, Kathy, and we grabbed our, our gear and we flew to Africa and spent some time there walking through the slums, seeing the work they're doing, meeting the artisans individually, and then kind of going to a much deeper level of purpose-driven work. I think it was a good refresher for me because I had to get outside of this failure in this time of like, what am I doing and why does this matter to understanding that hmm. even that one small meeting that we would have with this one family made a huge difference. And, and I think my, I was always thinking really big, you know, you it was a huge idea. Maybe it'll still come back someday. It's still holding on to that one. Um, but we were able to really impact the lives of the people that this group had been with um, in, in tremendous ways and, and to see how it had affected their lives. It was really exciting for me to spend that time there. Um, and also exciting to, cause I'm a strategy guy. So I was trying to help them figure out how do they continue to grow their program. I wanted to see firsthand what they were doing and what other ideas and what other support they could get to continue to grow that. As I came back, I spent some more time at that point trying to figure out what was next. And 2016 or no, no, a little before that, actually, one of our investors said, Hey, I've got, I bought this cereal company. And I know, I knew he had done that a few years prior. I didn't really know what he was doing with it, but he said, Hey, you know, i I know we've talked in the past about like fundraising and my kids were in sports and scouts and things like that. And so we sat down over his uh, breakfast table and we just started talking about like how we could leverage the products at the cereal company to fundraising efforts or healthier cereals. And just this discussion, he said, well, you want to come in and help get this going? I said, sure. And I, all of a sudden we just launched Good Grains and Good Grains was uh, looking at how do we make some healthier cereals for kids? Um, and at the same time, we created a fundraising arm for scouts and sports and programs with that. And what that spawned into was really trying to understand the market. And unfortunately, kids don't like eating low sugar cereal. <laughs> so it's really hard to sell a low margin product that way. But we did find a market that really needed it, which was a diabetic audience. And that we were able to create a cereal that they were able to eat with high fiber and was better than what was on the market that helped them stabilize their blood sugars through the day. And as I learned a lot about diabetes during that time, that it's just a massive problem. And so this turned into great purpose-driven work that we were able to then work on this product together. And at the same time, help him with the, the cereal company that needed some help as they were working on turning that around and getting that solid. So I had some, a great time there. Finally, I hung up my hat there as a cereal entrepreneur to an actual cereal entrepreneur. Um, I said, you know, this was fun, but things were going well there. Um, we decided that that one project was just going to be the diabetic cereal. We weren't going to go after the good grain side anymore. And I thought, well, that's where my heart was, is really expanding that project. Now that they're looking more set in terms of where they were heading, I decided to move on. And so again, I'm asking that question now, after I'd felt I'd had so much set for so long, what's next again? And so part of this entrepreneurial journey for me was, again, coming back to that inner voice of not blaming myself for, say, the past failures, but really learning from what each of them taught me. And so in that moment, I'm like, well, what have I learned? What have I loved doing? Where have I made the most impact? What can I show up for every day and get really excited about? And I had a, a friend who was my former Vistage chair, Don Piero, who said, you know, maybe coaching or something like that might be good for you. And I thought, well, wow, that's interesting. My wife was like, we'll just go get a job. And I'm like, yeah, that's easier to say to an entrepreneur than, you know, I'm a visionary entrepreneur. I love building and yeah, I will go get a job. I've always worked hard, but at that point, I thought, I'm like, that's not where I'm being called right now. That's not what I'm supposed to, what i supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I had been introduced uh, through one of Don, the Vistage uh, Chair's clients, to a program called EOS. And I had never heard of it, but I picked up a book called Traction and I read it. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. This really answers a lot of questions. I had been using a lot of the, the pieces that were in there in different ways through my years and running businesses. Um, and some of those I really resonated with and things that I had just naturally been doing. And I was like, wow, that's great. I love doing that. That's how we built great cultures in the past. But what I saw was there wasn't really a buttoned up system. And so the way they relate to it, it's like an operating system for your business. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I'm like, well, what am I going to do next? And I'm going to go just build my own system and coaching program. 
And that was what I made up my mind to do. Actually, at first I was going to be a Vistage share. And then I looked at the model and I'm like, it feels pretty dated to me. I love it. It's a great thing. I just was struggling near the end to sit in the meetings because it was just not for me. Um, so I thought, well, this isn't the right path for me. I told my wife, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go launch this. And she's like, really? We're going to go that route again, you know, starting something else up. And <laughs> right. thank God I've got an amazing wife who has trusted me and and been with us, been with our family through the ups and downs at every step of the way um, yeah. and supported me through the craziness of, of the wins and the losses. Um, and at that point she said, well, you know, what's right for you. And I, I told her about the EOS thing. And so, well, that's always an option too. And she's like, well, maybe you don't have to start something. Maybe you can just get licensed with them and actually work with them. So it's kind of like you're doing your own business, but you're also working with them. So I said, okay, she had given a lot over the years. And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go do this. Although I'd rather go start something. I'm going to, I'm going to go join them. So I joined them and, and I had an amazing time. I was there for a year and a half, two years, year. I don't know. It went so fast, but it was, I became certified, became a professional EOS implementer, they call it, um, for their type of coach. And I was excited to go work and help businesses. But then, like everyone in the world, COVID hit. Mm. And it was like, oh, okay, I just got started. I was two months in. I had wow. six clients and three of them immediately were coming up for our first meeting, said, hold on, COVID's happening. Let's wait and see what happens. So now all of a sudden, that income, new business was not going anywhere. And I had talked to a mentor of mine who had said, Zach, you know, when times like this, we can just double down on helping people. Sometimes it's not all about the income and, and our growth right now. You know, maybe we just need to sit back and see what we can do to help. So I did. Hmm. I started building decks for the coaches in the US because they didn't have digital materials. I started just joining and creating, you know, resources that would be helpful for the community and thought, well, it'll come, you know, I'm going to keep checking in with potential clients and seeing how they're doing and help wherever I can. But we were like most of us, we were locked up at home. There wasn't much I could do to get out. As we move forward, though, I was able to continue to pick up steadily clients over the next year, even through COVID and started running Zoom meetings in this room right where I'm sitting right now. And so eight hour sessions with senior leadership teams, um, because the type of coaching I do is this transformational leadership team coaching where we instill a system for their business. We take all these pieces that the EOS system provided when I was with them and get that instilled in the business and then roll it out through the company and really work on a transformational growth. And I was loving it because it was working and it was great. Even just sitting on a Zoom meeting and they were just fired up and I was fired up and this was great. But unfortunately, again, another hiccup came because EOS announced they were going to franchise and send us a, a 500 page agreement to sign that completely changed the relationship from me running my own business to working for them and using their email and not having my own leads and all that type of stuff. And I had to think long and hard about it. Long and hard meaning like maybe three weeks, five weeks. Yeah. Um, but that's about as long as I could take because we had to sign this document and hand over our clients or we had to move off on our own. And after I invested a ton into now getting this going, um, and I was super excited about the work I was doing with my clients, I had to decide to branch off on my own. And so I saw this a little bit of a detour. I'm still glad I did it. But what I found from that time, again, was just the learnings that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And so I'm thankful for all the coaches and implementers and the people in EOS because um, I wished them well as I left. I called them up and I said, hey, you guys are awesome. Love you guys. But I didn't sign up for this. So I'm moving on to do my own thing. And also, also the type, I don't like to burn, burn bridges. So I didn't aggressively go out and start trying to compete with them. They have their own thing. Um, instead, I launched my own coaching company, Top Teams, and I knew it was going to take some time. So I worked with uh, 10 other coaches that I invited in. I'd be on an advisory board because I've always found it to be so helpful to have this amazing group of advisors around you when you're launching anything new. I've definitely learned that the hard way over the years. Mm -hmm. But in having them up front, I started weekly meetings where I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my own coaching program. I'm going to do what I loved that EOS did and, you know, take some of the stuff that I was using before, take some learnings that I got from there, but I don't want to copy any of their stuff. Obviously, some of this stuff is just stuff every coach teaches across the board. That stuff's fine and that's going to be consistent, um, but I really want to see what's solving that job to be done again. Going back to that heart of how are we truly solving the problems for these companies and their people, because what I also saw in the coaching industry was some things I didn't like. I saw some coaches who were in it just to go make a big paycheck, who would charge a lot of money, who are more sales machines than they were transformation machines. And so when I saw that, I was like, ooh, yeah. I don't want to be that guy. You know, I don't want to be this kind of the sleazy, you know, click funnel-y guy that you see. And I'm like, that's not me. I don't think I can do that. But then when I saw real coaches who were in the business, these executive team coaches who were transforming companies and their people and really deeply cared, I'm like, that's me. That's what I want to do. And so 
I've been on this journey now in the last couple of years, building top teams, building out our own tools, working with my clients, testing them out. And thank God when I left DOS, I told all my clients, I'll introduce you to another implementer, or you can come with me on my new system. My system was still fairly new and not fully baked at the time. But I said, if you join me on this journey, I'll continue to give you my best. And every one of my clients stayed with me and uh, still working with me today, all of them. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to be on this journey, continuing to build out top teams now. And I'm going to pause here in a second because I've just been talking, but um, that also spawned the launch of Top Coach. So I can share more about this community and why I'm excited about that too. So I, I first of all, I want to acknowledge that. Thank you for sharing so authentically. I, I really mean that because oftentimes, you know, when we think about entrepreneurships or when people talk about their journey, they tend to just highlight the positive highlights, not what's really happening underneath the hood. And, and we know very clearly being in that side of the, of the coin where in entrepreneurship, there's going to be high tides and low tides, right? And part of it is knowing how to just ride a wave. And part of it is learning, you know, I'm a firm believer, you learn as much, if not more from your failures than you do from your success. And just hearing your story and seeing how you evolve from one point to another is it's inspiring, man. I just got to be honest. It, it really is. And, and one of the takeaways I got, which I really have to commend you for this, Zach, is because I think that the exercise that that lawyer shared with you early on was really such a great self-reflection exercise to do that it feels like you've carried on throughout your whole life, which is, can I envision what it is that I want to accomplish? And how does it make me feel? Because what I've heard from you, whether it's through the serial company, whether it's from creating your own agencies, whether it's the type of clients you take on or projects you take on, you're very purpose-driven. And if it doesn't align with that, you have that gut feeling that tells you something just doesn't feel right. And, and it doesn't really make sense for you to go further in that same direction. And yeah. you've really, from what I've heard from the stories that you just shared, learning to hone in when you have those feelings and to listen and then to take action that that's a muscle that you know quite honestly it's something i'm helping trying to train people to do because i've learned that when i don't follow where my intuition or my heart's leading and instead if i'm just looking at just a dollar sign it doesn't take me in a place that gives me really that joy or even the outcome that i'm truly yearning for you know it's always easier to see in hindsight but it's hard to see when you're going through it and it just from what you shared time, time again, it's really centering yourself and saying, wait, is this an alignment? Because if it's not, maybe I need to pass, right? And, and this leads to my second question, actually, is everyone has their own interpretation of how they define success. And so I'd love to hear, Zach, how would you define the word success given everything you've just shared in terms of your journey in entrepreneurship? What does success mean to you? Yeah, you know, it's it's that uh, thing that we wake up each day and we wonder why we get out of bed, right? <laughs> Man, and waking up sometimes is harder than other days. And so you nailed it. Like, it, I think it's having a clear vision and knowing that there is a purpose and there is some greater hope for the work that we do that is going to make an impact, um, which defines, helps us define what success is going to look like. Um, and to your earlier point on uh, Leatrice and planting that vision, I believe it's been super important every year. And it's something we have carried on. Even we had our kids back to school night the other night, we have an annual dinner with our family. We have a journal and every year we've got pictures, the kids have a sheet of paper and we write down our goals for the year. We reflect on the last year. I have them envision where they want to be next year and we write it down and it's just, just so powerful. And so it's a simple exercise, but I know how much that matters in terms of us being able to manifest what we want in our lives. And when I think about success, I think it's changed over the years. You know, when I was younger, it was like I could see, you know, there was an enticement to have more money and more stuff. Um, but as I've gotten older, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't want them. I mean, I really want a happy family. I want to have a healthy family. I want a family and people and teams that I work with that are doing great, great work that positively impacts people in the world in a great way. When we enhance our circle of impact where it leaves a legacy behind us, that would be true success to me. Um, mm. And I know we're all different in terms of where we might be on our, our journey of any kind of faith or spiritual aspect. But for me, I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. I'm, uh, I helped launch a church a few years back and 
So for me, I, I, I put it where eventually I'm going to meet my maker and I'm going to stand there. And, and I hope, you know, that, uh, the thought is that, yeah, you know, you use those gifts wisely. We all have different gifts. We all have different things that we are naturally good at. Um, but we can waste them or we can put them to good work. And, and I do believe that we should be doing good work. And one thing I think in our current culture does bother me is that we have people who are feeling like they're, you know, I heard a term the other day and it was something like quietly quit. And I thought, wow, where have we gone to a point where people will literally show up, do the minimal amount of work until they either get fired or asked to leave or just try to get the work done. So it looks like they're successful. It's just that bone's not in my body. I feel that we're made for a reason and to do good work and we're not to just show up and be lazy. I feel like success to me means we are going to use those gifts wisely and impact people in a really positive way. Yeah. The world needs more of that. And as course, as you get around the world, you see we are are super, super blessed with everything we have. And hopefully we feel a need to be part of this world and, and helping out others who are much less fortunate, whether it's in our own towns or around the world, because they're everywhere. I mean, yeah. my son and I were in San Diego a little over a month ago and just walking the streets and handing out water bottles because it was hot. And there were homeless people who were in the worst conditions you can imagine people sick and bent over and laying on the street who nobody cared to come up and help. And we can argue all day long about, you know, oh, they could have, you know, they could, they got themselves in this position. Okay, whatever. Do we have a heart? Do we care for people who are less fortunate, who might have made bad decisions, or maybe some people are just sick? Whatever their circumstances are, it doesn't mean that we have to turn a blind eye and that we can be part of the solution. So you're right. My success is more purpose-driven. I do hope to positively impact the world in a way that gets people to stop and think the world is bigger than us. And uh, hopefully we can be a little kinder and happier and nicer to each other yeah. as it's been a rough place the last couple of years. And uh, there's been a lot of anger and division and hatred and that tears me up inside. And I can't wait for the day that that starts to get to go the other way. Cause I feel like the sides are pulling more to the sides and yeah. we need more people pulling together. We really need people. That would be success that if we could come together in a way that says we don't need to hate our brother and sister out here, we don't need to hate these folks. We don't need to hate them because they believe something different. That's fine. We used to respect that. So my hope is that uh, I can be a, a positive light with the businesses I work with and my family for those reasons. Yeah, man, beautifully said, Zach. I am a hundred percent alignment with that, and I really feel the energy behind a word you just said. So I appreciate you for just being who you are because that's such a beautiful message and mission to serve. You know, going back to entrepreneurship, I, I think what's really interesting is. There's sometimes these misconceptions about what that really means, right? What what would you say is the biggest misconception of entrepreneurship that people often think is true, but it's just not? That's a great question. Not everybody's cut out for it. Uh, I, I think media culture today, everybody's kind of, you know, it's so easy and accessible to go create and launch and do things, right? You can create a Shopify store in five minutes. You know, if you're good on Canva and you can do some things, you can probably throw something together. But it's all the little stuff day in, day out, nighttime, next morning, over and over again. It's hitting your head really hard and getting back up again, over and over and over again. And I love that old Mike Tyson quote where he's like, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. Man, if you don't get punched in the face a million times over when you're running your own business or you're an entrepreneur, and if you're not, if you don't love that, I mean, nobody loves getting punched in the face, but if it doesn't excite you to solve those problems and to figure it out and you can't see the end vision of where this is going to go. If you do this right, then maybe you're not cut out to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is. And that's fine. You know, my wife doesn't want to do that. You know, she'll tell you clearly. Um, but thank God she balances me out because she helps me when we have discussions on change and other things, because sometimes I'm so ready to change and go. I need that balance to help pull back and really think through things because I'm a quick start and I'll move quickly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a tricky one. And, and our youth today see that and it's enticing, you know, but I think we should really be focused more in on our own unique gifts and where the, those can best be applied. And that doesn't just mean a college path. It doesn't just mean, you know, going and being an entrepreneur. That can be lots of different things. And, and I think we've got work to do as a society to help people better understand where they can go. Not everybody can go down the exact same path. Not everybody can be a YouTube star. Not everybody can launch their own business. Um, yet we tend to kind of look at what's shiny and hot and push everybody in that direction. Right. No. And when I really digest what you shared earlier too, Zach, the underlying theme that I got out of it is that there's power behind the words we use. There's definitely energy behind the words we use. And 
And I can understand and appreciate when you're going through not just the success, but also the failures, those failures really are, you know, it's like Mike Tyson getting really punched really hard, right? The, the words that come up to me, it just changing the language would be you learn or you earn. Mm. You learn, you earn. And I feel you really exemplify that meaning through just your way of being, because yes, there's times to earn or there's times to learn. And when you just have that, openness approach to entrepreneurship it makes the pill easier to swallow i feel right you know what i mean and i I love the fact that you're just you have that curiosity always wanting to learn and that will give you a better i feel a healthier association to the word failure because it's not necessarily failure if you learn something from it right when we had launched Seagood, we got an opportunity to meet with Sequoia. And it was one of those early on where I was like, oh, that's cool. We met with Roloff Botha, who had, he had uh, brokered the YouTube deal. It was like, okay, who gets to sit with this guy, you know, and even got there late. Like we uh, had, they had launched Apple Maps and it took us to the middle of like a cow farm and we went to Sequoia. So thank God he still saw us, but I'll never forget the meeting because when we sat down, I learned so much in the matter of like 15 minutes from somebody who had been working with all these companies and startups for so long. And And just that he had told us that he's like, you know what, this concept, this entrepreneurial concept that you have doesn't have to be proven in this huge, massive way that you're envisioning. He's like, get it out in your community, get 200 good businesses doing this, you know, get great reports, see that traction growing early on. And I, and it was so powerful hearing that because at the time, you know, when you start something, you look at it up here, you can see where it's going. If you're a visionary, you, you picture where you want it to be. Meanwhile, he's like, no, we need to prove this concept. And fast forward later down the years down the road, I've been talking a lot about the jobs to be done. That concept really does have to solve a real need. We're not just selling something to sell something because I don't like that either. I don't love the busyness that we've created in our world today. We need to do work that matters. We need to make great products. We need to do things that are actually helpful to people. And so, yeah, you learn and you earn like the learning part I'm doing every day. It's why we launched the top coach community because I realized I can't be a great coach. I can't be a master coach and I'd love to be a master coach someday. I'm certainly not today, but I can only do that with peers around me. And so we started inviting in coaches from all different backgrounds, breaking out of their bubbles to come together. And currently we're you know close to 80 coaches and continuing to grow. And we're about to hire somebody and start inviting more people in. But what I've learned is to take some of these things a little slower. I like to move fast, but this one I slowed down on purpose. We're mm-hmm. still in our alpha phase. Sometimes it feels like we're going a little slow but also another good mentor of mine and a friend, Mark Abbott, who I've been working with his team at 90.io, fantastic company, helping apply these business coaching principles into business software. He always says, you're right where you need to be. And it's calming to me. And I appreciate that calming nature. And that's been why I really enjoy our conversation so much because your presence is so calming. And, and I think one thing you can tend to do as an entrepreneur too, is you can get a little uptight and not sleep and not take care of yourself. And so like our, one of our team members at top coach or um, one of our community members, Anna, who talks about flow, um, she's been teaching me a lot about flow science. And so things that I've had to do lately is really take better care of myself because I can't mm. keep showing up and keep doing this if I don't take care of myself. So I know yeah. we're going a little direction here, but I think that's the whole idea of flow. It's like, we, we got to take care of ourselves in order to be able to do this great work, to have success, to be the entrepreneur, or it'll be all over tomorrow if we don't. No, hundred percent. I, I, I love that we're going this direction because I totally agree because Zach, it's like, we live in this hustle and grind mindset that, you know, I, I don't really love those words that people use, right? Hustle and grind. Right. And the thing is, is that it, it tends to glamorize you're running a marathon, but you're going to be sprinting every day. And it's not the case because it's, it's a marathon of life. You got to pace yourself. You got to be able to be able to ride the waves, but be able to conserve and re-energize that energy so that you can really be in flow, but also be effective when you're in that flow, not be depleted and just go like up and down and just, you know, maybe when, you know, before we were married and kids, that's more possible. You could pull those all nighters. But I mean, as you can appreciate (laughs) and after being a dad and, Oh my God. Like it's a sleep becomes such a valuable commodity. <laughs> we are right. right. You know, I'm curious because, you know, I'm, I'm really am grateful that you invited me to the top coach community and your experience. And now in this current chapter as a business coach, and I really see you more with a holistic perspective because of the breadth of experience that you had, Zach, I'm curious, what's been the most reoccurring roadblock that you see your clients encounter that they typically seek your advice for and 
what's been on the top of the mind? I think a lot of it is uh, simply a fear of change. You know, mm. they wouldn't say that. I don't think anyone would say that. But ultimately, when I meet, I meet with a lot of smart, smart people, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm impressed to be in the room with so many of the people I meet with. And some of these folks, you know, you know, PhDs and run all sorts of successful companies. And, but meanwhile, we all just get stuck sometimes. And we all have trouble being accountable to ourselves and our team sometimes. And sometimes it's hard to do the hard work, right? And so having a game plan, having systems in place to allow that to flow and work throughout an organization isn't easy. The team dynamics are not easy. And so whatever the issue may be, we oftentimes get stuck too long. And so I'm grateful during COVID because I was introduced to, you know, Mel Robbins and her five second rule. And she's a best-selling author and, you know, great stuff, really simple concept. Countdown from five, you get out of bed if you don't feel like doing it, because the whole point is you don't feel like doing it. But if we just live by our feelings, we're never going to feel like doing anything. We're not going to get up. We're not going to go to work. We're not going to do the hard thing. So what I've seen most often with these teams is not me telling them, hey, you're just stuck, make a decision because, yeah, that's easy to say, but it's hard to do. But helping them understand that by taking a look at the root problems, whatever it might be, it could be an issue, it could be some sort of item in their business, some sort of opportunity or idea they want to go after. We have to learn how to discuss those in a healthier, better way in order to really come up with good solutions. And we need to come up with solutions because oftentimes we have these crazy long lists with all sorts of stuff. So we need to compartmentalize it better and decide what to do with it. Some of it, we just need to throw in the parking lot. We just need to kind of set it aside. We put it on a long-term list. The other stuff, we need to get better at making decisions as a team. And we do that because we have better, healthier, trusting relationships. And so that takes time to build. Sometimes you go into an executive team and maybe they don't have the right team members at the table. Maybe they don't have trust. Maybe they're not willing to change. So those are deeper things that a good coach can do and help bring to perspective. So sometimes that's through teaching the different tools and methods. Other times it's opening up my own personal stories. Other times it's us bringing in an expert and, you know, a strengths finder, a predictive index and assessments to understand. One of my clients, the guy was a Jeopardy champion, super smart guy, went in and and I love his team. They were awesome. But the funny thing was in the, you know, few hours together solving some key issues with their company, they couldn't make one decision. I think we got two small decisions done on this huge list of items. Hmm. And after testing, we realized nobody had the natural ability to pull the trigger. That's not something hmm. I could necessarily learn in the first couple of meetings with them, but that's why these assessments are really powerful too. So yeah. I love having these great tools and resources and other coaches. That's where the community comes in yeah. because I don't know what I don't know, but yeah. I do know when I see a gap in a problem and I'll, I'll say, Hey, let's bring in so-and-so see if we can figure this out. Because once we address the root of the problems, we can now come up with solutions to solve them for the longer term. Yeah. So many times we just quickly solve problems or we just listen to the loudest person in the room who's making the argument. We don't get to the root. We don't fully understand it. We're not giving ourselves the time to be educated and really learn about what's going on because we just want to get it done. Right. It's the same in politics and life right now, right? Everybody's just arguing different ways, but we're not coming together. We're not truly putting everything out on the table, not politicking, politicking in business, we say is the one person who keeps saying the same thing over and over again until they get their way. Instead, we have a good facilitator who says, hold on, I think we heard that. Do you have anything new to add? Mm -hmm. Well, let's dig into that. Is that really the root cause? And if it is, how do we solve that? What do we want to do? Because ultimately, we get to decide which path we want to go. And sometimes it's not doing anything. Sometimes we've just taken on way too much. Yeah. And that less is more. And that's been a big, I think, life lesson for me too the last few years is take on less have more impact by saying no more often, you know? So yeah. those are the types of things that I, I really love doing. I even forgot the question now because I went off on a flow. No, <laughs> it's no, I love it when you're in a flow, man. It, it the, the question was, what's the biggest roadblock? And the way you answered it was, it's the yeah. fear of change. Yes. And, and I can see that too. I can see that also with some of my clients. And that's, and, and the two things I just want to bring up, if it's helpful for you as you're sharing with your community is that, you know, two things I say, one fear, F-E-A-R, all that stands for is false evidence appearing real, mm. right? It's in your mind. And you, when you think of it, you fear it, then that becomes your reality, right? It's just false evidence appearing real. The second thing too, and I share this on my 17th episode is because again, it goes with the language we use. A lot of times we're anchoring what's the opportunity cost of doing status quo versus doing something new, but yet we don't measure it in a way well, what's the opportunity benefit? Why are we anchoring it to opportunity costs? If it's too much of an opportunity cost, I'm not going to do it. Then it's a harder to actually take action. But if you actually don't spend that time and effort 
to quantify and qualify, well, what's the opportunity benefit of going with, with a different plan? And to know that, that's what you're actually losing out on. And so it's a really different anchoring point in terms of what that is, but you got to be able to throw that into the mix if you truly want to evaluate the pros and cons. What's the actual opportunity benefit as it relates and not just only make a decision based on how, what's the size of the opportunity cost, right? So yeah, that, and then I go into that in that episode, but wow. So Zach, at the current stage of your life, because I get a sense that having a balance of your mind, body, and soul is important, just not only for your sanity's sake, but for being able to be present with your family, be able to do what you love and to really execute on the vision that you have. What do you do to maintain that balance of mind, body, and soul, either on a daily or weekly basis? Yeah, great question. I think you feel it more as you get older, right? You feel a little more invincible as you're younger, but once I hit 40, I'm 45 this year, so born in 77. It's coming fast. I don't know how I'm going to have three high schoolers right now. Where's the time going? But man, those things are so important because some days you just don't feel like it if those aren't in balance. And I know I can make myself do it. I've, I've trained myself how to have the tricks. You know, Mel, Mel's five second rule works. I'll get up and I'll do it anyway. But when you're doing it and you're not feeling it, that also, you know, as Anna, the flow coach would tell you, like, sometimes we are running too hard. We're taking on too much. We're burning ourselves out and then we're not going to have the right impact. So for me, it's it's a mix, mind, body, and soul of, you know, I told you I'm a spiritual guy. So I wake up and I, I read a devotional in the morning to get my head right. I don't go to the phone to email and everything first. I have to give myself space to mentally connect with the day, think about what I want to do. I'm also not the type who's waking up super early and trying to mass optimize the day and do all the planning. I'm going to get full sleep. I'm using the aura ring now, which I love. And that's tracking my sleep, tracking my heart rate value. And I'm really living that out. And thanks to um, Brian from a company called Heroic, who had founded this company. It's awesome. You got to check it out, by the way, if you haven't seen it. I just love what he's been doing. And I saw he was using this aura ring. And so I started using that. But it's giving me that ability to know I'm not sleeping enough. And my sleep hasn't been good quality enough, you know, so I'm taking care of the sleep. The other side is exercise. So my son had wanted to make the tennis team last year in his freshman year. And I said, Hey buddy, you know, I don't think you're going to make it like, just honestly, like you got work to do. Like, and it, and he's, and I said, well, do you want to practice? What do you want to do? He said, well, will you come practice with me? So he made a chart and stuck it on my office door and said, dad, will you spend 30 days with me and practice every day and work out every day? I was like, Whoa, that's like, <laughs> that's a big commitment. When I've been going to my desk every day and haven't been consistent myself with any workouts for a while, but I thought, well, that's a good challenge. Well, you know, we did it and we did it for 90 days. Fast forward, he made the high school team, even played singles. And, nice. and now he's uh, still practicing, loves tennis. We joined a tennis club in Claremont and now he's, uh, you know, his coach even hinted that he probably is going to be on varsity in his sophomore year. And, you know, he's playing great. And he went from a kid who barely played to, to loving it. And that's now given me something to do and exercise and join the club. So now we're working out. So if I'm taking care of my health, getting physically active, and that includes having fun, you know, and, and I think I've been so driven and focused on work. Sometimes I can forget that the fun is important too. So I've yeah. always been good about downtime with the family. I don't want to do any of this if I can't have that. And so even in the agency days and younger days, I tried to take weekends off as much as I could. Sometimes I had work travel, but my kids, my family come first and so that meant, you know, stopping work, coming home, sitting at the dinner table, even if I had to get back on and work late, I'd rather do that and I'll get the work done, but I'd rather do that and make sure those things are, are prioritized first, because then I love doing the work I do. If those yeah. things get out of balance, I quickly get to the point where I don't want to do it anymore. Beautiful. So let me ask you, Zach, in terms of advice around the word thriving, for my listeners that are either entrepreneurs or their career professionals that are just hungry to start thriving in life, either they're thinking of starting a new company or they want to do a career pivot, what advice can you share to help them? Probably give them the advice that uh, Leatrice gave me, like take some quiet time. I mean, get wherever you lived, go on a walk somewhere, find somewhere quiet, take a journal, take your phone, probably not your phone, better to have paper and pen, you know, get outside the technology for a minute. And just go sit with your thoughts, like close your eyes. If you're spiritual, pray about it. Say, you know what? I don't know necessarily where I'm going, but give yourself that time. We have so many distractions all around us that we're just running forward all day long. When we can stop and really reflect on where we want to be, how we can use those gifts and what that looks like and really get to that inner vision that 
inner voice that we can hear in our head really calling us to do something and then then write it down. I mean, some people have dreams, you know, they write it down in the morning, uh, take this walk, do this. And then what you can do is you can share it with some trusted friends, some trusted family and say, you know, what? here's what I'm thinking, yeah. you know, and also be open to their advice. You know, sometimes not every big idea is, is the right thing. And I'm not saying it has to be a big idea, but I always trust those uh, people around me. That's why those advisors come in really handy because they know me and they know my flaws. And that, uh, as I had heard on another podcast sometime, uh, like I got referred to it as, as having Lint brothers in life, people that you can reach down in that bottom of your pocket and pull out that lint, like you can share those kind of things with. So when you have those people you can go to and say, here's what I'm thinking, you're going to get some valuable feedback that you can use in making decisions on that next step. Zach, you, you mentioned about Mel Robbins in a five second rule. I, I'm curious, what book have you read in the past couple of years that has been the most transformative for you? Hmm. Like the first one that come, comes into mind. I mean, I guess I would have to just go with that one for the minute. Um, yeah, there's certainly more. I've got a whole shelf right here. So I'm, I'm glancing at all my favorites. <laughs> um, I also like Jim Quick's Limitless. He's mm -hmm. fantastic. And I, I would thank Mel for the early days of COVID because I think a lot of us felt a little helpless. And so, you know, the, the rule, I, I've told a lot of people this rule and <laughs> it can sound really silly and overly, overly simple, but oh my gosh, if it doesn't work, we all get stuck. And that's just one of the ways you can get unstuck. And sometimes you just have to do it even when you don't feel like it. And so I've been grateful to that. I wouldn't say it's a super in-depth business book or anything with a whole lot of theory, but you know, what's tested for me is showing that it works. If you get on and you see all the people who talk about it, say, you know, it changed my life for me, even in the start of COVID, I was like, I don't want to, I was starting to feel, you know, a lot of a sad or a desk at home eating too much. Um, I even started a workout routine online and started doing this app center app. And also, you know, for 90 days did that straight, you know? And so I just got in a routine because I had to wake up every day and say, five, four, three, two, one, get your butt out of bed, go do it. And that helped me when I was on top of those things, like we just talked about when my body and soul are in the right place, then I can go perform at work and do the other things and help my clients. And so I take it on as a duty now. Like I feel like I've been blessed with a lot in my life. I have had to struggle through a lot. Not everything's come easy. I've had major ups and downs in life. But no matter whether I have any money or not, I, I'm still walking this earth and I can still be kind and helpful to other people. And so I'm going to keep plugging in and doing as much as I can every day. And so I don't have the option of just sitting still. So I, I think I think Mel for helping me get out of a little bit of a funk a couple of years ago. And I'd say that's really driven me to really the best last three, four years have been the best professionally for me ever, even even after all the crazy ups and downs. Um, yeah. Because if you know, in a startup world, when you're launching a startup, that four years of eGood wasn't me getting paid a lot of money. That was called me working for sweat equity. And when we closed that, that didn't really pan out so well. And that actually cost me a lot more investment of money I'd made prior. So yeah. um, it seems like this crazy dream where you're making tons of money, you have all the stuff. But if you double down and you invest it all and you keep going and it doesn't work out, well, that goes away quickly. So at one point there, it was literally restarting over from complete scratch. And that's hard. That's hard emotionally it's hard to come back from but now i'm so grateful and so i think mel because she tells in her story about she was about the same age i think she's early 40s and her husband had a restaurant and it was not doing so well and she didn't want to get out of bed she was trying to be like this radio or, or talk show host and things were failing time and time again and and just kind of going along with her journey and seeing how she was able to use this and, it, and the story connected with me too, because as I grew up, I wanted to be an astronaut. I went to space camp and, you know, like lots of kids, but what inspired the five, four, three, two, one, she'd saw an, uh, a space shuttle taking off and it was counting down, you know, 10, nine, eight. And she saw that on TV. And so when she woke up the next morning, she was like, I don't want to get out of bed, but she made herself, she thought of the countdown and it was that easy. And that's what sparked this whole thing. So really powerful. So great question. I love business books. One more thing I'll say on business books is I even tossed it out to our community the other day. Hey, what if we started sharing stories or or reading out these books or sharing you know our thoughts in our community too? Because I think they speak differently to us as well. So we can read the same thing, but get different things out of them. So mm -hmm. having more dialogue, obviously there's book clubs and things like that out there, but we don't see a lot of that in like a professional kind of business coach setting. Like, so we've all read, you know, Masters of Scale or, or the Five Second Rule or here on a mission or all these different ones that are out there or any of Lencioni's books, but it's getting the stories and understanding how do they connect with people and then being able to tell those stories to clients. So clients who haven't read the book, but these stories and these nuggets of wisdom are, are really impactful in our lives. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. I, I, I'd love to be part of that for sure. <laughs> 
So Zach, uh, second to last question. Uh, this is a question I always ask my guests, which is if the DeLorean was real and time travel is a reality, what is one thing you would tell yourself if you had the ability to travel back 10 years ago and share with your younger self? Don't worry. Have more fun in the process. I wouldn't try to rig anything. I wouldn't want to know. <laughs> I'd want to keep going after what I went after, but I just want to remind myself just enjoy it a little bit more. Be yeah. that person who's got a smile on their face. Don't get angry or upset when as much, you know, when things aren't working out. Cause sometimes you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world. And I think, uh, especially entrepreneurs, people who go that route, like we see these shiny examples today of, you know, the perfect family members. Um, you got to be involved in the school. You got to help out with the kids' sports. You got to be on the board of this. You got to do that. You know, I've sat on numerous boards. I love doing that work. But I also have taken on so much at times that it has made it not fun. And then there's moments where you're like, I'm spent, I'm tired. I don't have any extra energy trying to be the perfect everything to everybody. So I guess it would be, don't worry, but maybe also say no a little bit more too. <laughs> it's okay to say no. <laughs> I, I I love that, man. I, I What I got from that, Zach, is the, wor the words that come to mind is just give yourself the space and grace. Mm, and when yeah. you do, you let abundance and opportunity kind of flow in because you're just not always like in a rush, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Man, I want that more every day right now. I think the more I can just be more at peace and pause and take more time, I know I can do better work. Uh, and it's amazing. You can actually get a lot more done in the day when you don't take on as much and you can have greater impact. I just see it so often. And yeah. So I'm I'm excited for you, Ben. I'm excited for this, what you're doing. I'm, I'm <laughs> thankful to be on this show because the episodes I've listened to, and it was fun listening to Aloe Black recently when you interviewed him and just hearing people's stories are so impactful in our lives and just understanding that, you know, even if it's not a one-to-one, -one, like their journey, you just hear that story of how people overcome those challenges. And, yeah. and I think it's really inspiring to me and, and I'm grateful you're, you're sharing those stories. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for you being here, Zach, because you definitely did not hold anything back when you shared. And, and it's and it's refreshing, honestly. It's refreshing to hear because every time I have a guest on, there's something about their story that I can relate to. We're all human. We all have our own. We're all taking different tests. We all have our own different experiences, but there's a oneness to it. And when you hear and you experience and you listen to other people's journey it becomes more apparent how close we really are you know and so my last question to you zach is where can our listeners find you well they can find me on linkedin online pretty i'm pretty much everywhere and my name's not very common so zach swire i am relaunching my website soon here and that'll be zachswire.com you know and you can go there z-a-c-k-s-w-i-r-e and uh, if you want to learn about what I do or our community or anything, I'm always happy to talk to anyone. So you're welcome to uh, message me and I would love to chat with you and learn more about you and what you do. I'm just kind of a natural connector, love chatting with new people. So please do reach out. I, I, I seriously mean that. Um, I was inspired. I read a book by a guy the other day um, and he put his phone number in the back of the book and he's a pretty big author and he's he's dead serious. You can actually call him. And I thought that's pretty amazing to be that open and and I know that's not saying no. <laughs> I just talked about saying no. But the funny thing is most people don't ever reach out. So I have shared this thing in the past where I, I try to let people know I am accessible. And, and I really mean it. Shoot me a message. I, I will respond. Um, and I do personally respond to everything. So oftentimes it's it's led to just really great connections and and just cool conversations. So yeah. if you want to reach out, I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome, man. And I'm going to include all your information in the show notes. So our audience will be able to find you um, fairly easy. So no problem there. But one last thing too, do you want to give a plug about Top Coach? Because, you know, that's one of the communities you're building, right? Yeah, sure. Um, Top Coach is currently, it's it's a private referral, mostly referral-based uh, community of business coaches. And coaches, we also include consultants and guides and, you know, because we use different terms sometimes. Um, I know consultants and coaches are different, but we do expand that uh, horizon, that that definition of, of what a coach is a little bit within the community. Um, so currently we are looking for anybody who is within any other system, who is looking to become a master coach and realizes that they can't get there only by learning and getting better at the thing that they're doing today. So 
you know, just as I was in US before and others were in different programs, there's lots of different coaching groups and programs out there. Certainly, we're not asking you to leave any of those. We're saying we're above and beyond that. We're this breakout group who says, we're going to learn together. We're going to challenge each other. We're coming to be resources to each other. Um, the great part too, is I'm looking to build a great bench of other coaches that we can refer to. Like I mentioned, I've actually referred a lot of our coaches to business of my clients because I'm not the person who does that thing. So if that sounds like a community to be interested in, certainly reach out. You can go to topcoach.community and uh, you can fill out, uh, there's a link there right now. It's a private community, but you can fill out a little application to join and I will get back to you and have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom to see if it's a fit and tell you more about it and let you see what we're doing there. Fantastic, man. Zach, thank you so much for giving so generously today. I really am grateful and blessed to be able to, you know, I know we connected because of Dan Bennett, right? And he was a guest on this show before and I'm just happy that he connected us and I'm just excited to see what what more things we can collaborate on, man, because I, I love the energy that you have and I feel you have a very similar map and compass. And so whatever I can do to help add value in your life, I mean, please, please let me know, man. Me too, Ben. Thanks so much, man. I'm, I'm so stoked to be here. And Dan is an incredible guy. And so I'm so glad he introduced us. And uh, thanks so much for having me here on the show. This has been an incredible time with you. Fantastic. Thanks, Zach. Wow. Folks, what an interview. The main takeaway I got from today's interview reminds me of a Henry Ford quote, and that is, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. Folks, I really resonate what Zach shared about how he defines success. Happy family, healthy family. It's when family, people, and team that are doing great work that are positively impacting the people in the world. When we enhance our circle of impact, where it leaves a legacy behind us, that's when true success means to me. We all have different gifts. Success is using our gifts wisely and impacting people in a positive way. If there's three words that I feel that Zach embodies, as the captain of his entrepreneurial ship. It's faith, hope, and love. If you enjoyed today's interview, please share this episode with your loved ones, business partners, or teammates that you feel can benefit. I really appreciate you joining us today. If you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button so that we can thrive together with a stronger mind, body, and soul. Until next time, folks. Be kind to yourself. Be in delight. Be you. Thank you so much for tuning in to my Boom Vision podcast. If you'd like to find out more about me in this podcast, head over to benjaminye.com. That's spelled B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-Y-E-H.com. If you haven't already, click subscribe and I'll catch you next time.